Proverbs 11. Woo. Give me 25. 25, I'll do it faster. Uh, y'all all right, all nations? I feel like prophesying. I feel like bringing water to those who are thirsty. Water to those who are thirsty. And the Lord is saying, I'm bringing water to those who are thirsty. Woo! That's your word. He's bringing water to them that are thirsty. He's bringing water to those that are thirsty. Yeah. All right, Proverbs eleven twenty five. Wow. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs 11, 25. 25. Whoever brings water will be enriched. And one who waters will himself be watered. I'm going to talk real quickly about servanthood. But I'm going to call it something that is a country and western song. And uh, it'll make sense hopefully as I teach it out. We're going to call this thing out. Dance with the one that brung you. <laughs> Ronald Reagan used it in his campaign, but it's a country song that says, Dance with the one that brung you. Father, help me preach this thing out in Jesus' name. Amen. You all can be seated on your way down. Look at somebody and tell them, Dance with the one that brung you. When you get to the dance, you don't switch partners. When the music starts, you don't switch partners. You dance with the one that brought you to the party. Are y'all here? Yes, sir. All right. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 11. I'm going to teach this out because one of the things that is a root to our church, and we've been in this series about some of the roots, what lies at the root of all nations, San Antonio is really what lies at the root of the Rock Fellowship. And so we're excavating through what built us and what our foundation looks like. And so the root system that I want to deal with today is the root system of servanthood. We are big on servanthood. Somebody shout that with me, servanthood. Say it again, servanthood. It's how any ministry moves and how any ministry grows is by the level of servant, servanthood and the level of servanthood and sonship that lands in a house. And I believe that the way to the kingdom of God has to do with serving other people. That if you serve God, you cannot serve God in ex except you're serving somebody else. God is invisible. God is not seen. He's God. He's, he's, he's spirit. He is wind. He is everything. But what he is not is visible. He is not tangible. He is ethereal and eternal. He is not finite. He is infinite. And so, therefore, because he is infinite, he cannot possess bodies uh, for long because bodies have expiration dates and therefore he could not fully be God okay and so because of that understanding when we serve the kingdom of God it's because we're serving people how I serve you and how you serve each other is a representation of who we are in the kingdom of God Jesus said how will men know that we love him except we have love one for another that it matters that I love you and it matters that you love me. But the proof in how we love each other is not what we say to one another. The proof is in how we serve one another. If you see a man who doesn't serve his family, the Bible says he is worse than an infidel. And an infidel is a person who doesn't even believe in God. Which the connection is in order to really say you believe in God, you must be a person who serves. 
In order to be a Christian, you must serve somebody else or serve something greater than yourself or serve something that you may consider less than yourself. Servanthood is the way of the kingdom of God. Shout that with me. Servanthood is the weight and the way of the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to take good notes in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says this. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Which means he died when you wasn't even thinking about him. And much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we, I'm sorry, but for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having become reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Let me just break this down to basement level. You ready? We serve because we're saved to serve. If I can take all of the words that uh, Paul used to uh, describe salvation and reconciliation, I serve because I have access to God. No one has to ask me, beg me, mandate me, reprimand me for servanthood. Servanthood is the natural response to a people who are grateful that they are saved. Y'all quiet up in here? Because I'm already messing with your sacred cow. The truth of the matter is, I don't just give my money, but I give my body to the purposes of the things of God. Are you here? I serve because I'm reconciled back to him. I serve because my sin says I deserve death. But I serve because the the repercussions of death was taken out upon his son, which gives me access. And I serve because I am now reconciled back to God. When I first got saved, one of the first things I learned how to do right early was serve. I didn't sing in the choir. I didn't sing on a praise team. I didn't join any men's ministries. The first thing I learned to do was vacuum the church's carpet. I don't know where it came from. One day I saw stuff on the floor and I asked somebody, her name was Nikki. I said, hey, do you know what a vacuum cleaner is? She took me to a closet, opened it up. I took the vacuum cleaner, plugged it in before Bible study and started vacuuming. The reason why I did that is because I was happy to be a Christian. See, y'all quiet. You didn't have a story prior to. I get it. Most of y'all were born in church. And I was too, but I just, I was born in church, but I wasn't born in God. And so the truth of the matter is, is that, yes, I was. But but what happened is, is when I got saved, I considered. But everything else I tried was not working for me. But when I came to this, I had acceptance from him. He didn't drop me. He let me talk to him. He didn't consider my private sin and throw me away. And because I felt this level of love and acceptance from him, the least thing I can do is vacuum his church. Someone say, why are you vacuuming, young man? I'm like, I just wanted to because I want the church to look clean. But the motive behind that was not just the cleanliness of the church. It was the fact that I felt called to do this. Because I was saved. I was reconciled back to God. And when I considered my story and what I had did and how I really let him down prior to, I was grateful to do anything I could to serve. That vacuum and graduated to cleaning up men's urinals. This is before singing in the choir. I'm telling you how this church was built. Men... Would, would, you know. <laughs> Urinals, you know. If you're not careful and you step too close and look down, you wonder who missed. And how did you miss? Somebody had to clean that up. So me being excited, we get paper towels. And put it up. And sometimes, oftentimes, that stuff gets on your hand. Y'all quiet. Why did that matter? It didn't matter to me because I was saved. I was excited to be reconciled back to God. 
Now, 1 Peter 2, 9 says this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, help me, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are a people. I serve because at one point I was not a people, but now I am a people. That means at once I had no identification or purpose. But I serve because now I fully understand I am the righteousness of God. So it's a revelation shift that I serve and I give because of my designation in the kingdom of God. It has nothing to do about apostles. We don't serve so the pastors and leaders can see you serving. I don't serve and let everybody see what I'm doing or all of a sudden come alive because apostles walking by. And I get, I know why people do it because in their own house, they don't clean up until they have the company. Uh Uh-oh. Now listen, somebody ain't going to be over here today. Y'all clean up y'all room. (laughs) So let's talk about why servanthood is so important. Y'all ready for this? I'm going to give you five ways that God sees your servanthood. You ready? Number one, five ways that God sees your servanthood. Number one, your servanthood may go unnoticed by man, but never unnoticed by God. Shout that with me. My servanthood may go unnoticed by men, but never unnoticed by God. So if somebody don't pat you in the back and thank you for standing on the door, don't be offended. Oh, my God. Don't be offended if no one saw you waving in the parking lot. Don't be offended. Because man can only see so much before he's distracted. Or she's a, but when God, he sees everything that you do. Are y'all here? Here's the real question. Who do you want to reward you more? Because if I call your name, that's your reward. But when he calls your name. Number two, he judges my service independent of everyone else. Well, everybody ain't doing this. I'm doing this. He's not looking at theirs. When he's talking to you, he's looking at yours while he's talking to you. So he judges our service independent of the next person. Number three, he uses servanthood as an object lesson to teach and inspire other people. So when we say, hey, we got an impact day coming up and you decide, you know, you know, you know what? I'm not going to show up to that. What kind of example did you just make before somebody watching you? Because if a new beginner is, that's coming to Christ comes to the impact day, and you a leader doing something totally different, their perspective is, okay, what's going on here? Oh, I don't care. Here's number four. I really don't. Not anymore. I hear Houston calling my name. Let's keep moving. Number four, God will defend and validate you. Are y'all here? When you serve, God will defend and validate you. Y'all are still quiet. When you are a servant to other people, God defends and validates you. Not people defend. God defends. He may use people to do it, but he is the one defending you when you are a servant. Let me tell you why I, mean, I works in a church context. If you are a servant in the house and somebody got an issue with you and I hear about it, my first thought process is they don't even serve. At least they trying. You're not even here. Am I offending you? I'm going to holler in a couple of weeks, but I've got to teach this out his roots now. Listen. So when you're serving others, God will defend you, and if they attack you, he will avenge you. Okay, here's number five. 
What you sow in servanthood, he will multiply back to you. Um, there's a Mike Murdoch, one of the greatest, at least in his hour and his time, was one of the greatest kingdom thinkers and, should I say, clever wordsmiths in the body of Christ. He said something I thought was so powerful. You know what that is? He says, what you sow, Glenda, in another man's vineyard, you're reaping your own. How you serve somebody else's vision is how people will serve you. In other words, you will reap you in a future season. And I don't know how many times I've seen myself in my church. The good and the difficult. I have seen myself in the church. Because I realized what I sold to a previous place. God was going to bring me back. Eventually you will see you again. The question is, which you do you want to see in the future? If you can't sow and serve in another man's dream. When it's time for your dream, expect people not to be present for yours. If you quit in this dream, they'll quit in your dream. And it comes back multiplied. Because ultimately, it's his vision. Are y'all here? It's not my vision. It's not your vision. It's God's vision. Oh, Listen, it's not my vision for me. It's God's vision for me. I just, I just manage his vision for me. Are y'all here? So ultimately you're not offending the person. You offend Christ. Who gave the man the vision or the woman the vision that you're connected to. So when they ask you to serve, you're it's, it's the Holy Spirit saying, I need you to be a part of this part of this person's vision. Now, here's the thing, the way it works. I'm not trying to hurt you in the future. But the way the earth works like this, if you sow it, you reap it. That's good or bad. Ooh-wee. Let's go out up here. Let's, let's keep talking about this, this servant and stuff. Uh, Proverbs 14, 35. Are y'all Okay. All right, pat yourself on your chest. Be like, it's going to get better in a minute. But you know, when you first start, you got to plow. Okay, Proverbs 14, 35. We're going to holler in a minute. Proverbs 14, 35. The king's favor is toward a servant who acts wisely, but his anger is toward him who acts shamefully. The scripture says his favor or his acceptance or his will is for those who act wisely. I was reading the story of David the other day, and I thought about, and I actually posted about it online, David is having a conversation with Saul, and Saul is throwing the javelin at David's head. And uh, I don't know about y'all, but consider the amount of stress that David's under when somebody is throwing the weapon of choice, skilled at this weapon, at your head, aiming to kill you. And the Bible says that David acted wisely. And the Bible says that when Saul saw how well behaved David was, he feared him. Every believer is going to have a javelin season. How you respond to the season of the javelin will determine God's favor for your life or the lack thereof. Whether it's your boss that's consistently aiming for your job, how you respond matters. Do you cuss them out? Do you create little pockets of, of, of communities within that team of people that got something negative to say about the management? Y'all quiet. I'm talking to Christians. Are you on the group chat that they're not a part of with something negative to say? Are you sowing seeds of mischief and, dis and, and, uh, and, and, and discord amongst the brethren? Well, I don't know why they said that. I don't know. I don't understand. Little seeds. Little pockets. Little communities of, of murmur and gossip. You didn't say what you was offended about, but you threw enough pebbles of, of a fits in the room that those who are just as hungry as you caught that thing. Everybody has a season of the javelin. 
everybody's going to have a season where those who are supervising over your life and your journey may turn on you for a second. Or at least it feels like it. But can I tell you something? God was using it the whole time. We shouldn't be upset with Saul. You really should be upset with God. Because he's the one that allowed it. For the Bible says, read your Bibles, that an evil spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. God's the one that authorized it. Because he's trying to grow you. And if you act wisely, then you get the king's favor. All right. Y'all ready? How do I know this? Proverbs eleven twenty nine 29 says this. He who troubles his own church. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not what it says. <laughs> he who troubles his own ministry. Uh, he who troubles his own house. He who troubles his own job. Will inherit wind. And the foolish will be servant to the wise hearted. All right, can we keep moving? Hebrews 6, <laughs> Hebrews 6, verse 9. I'm going to start at verse 9. Hebrews 6, verse 9. Let's look at this together. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. But, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. The things that accompany, look at your neighbor and say, there are better things concerning you. Things that accompany your salvation. So salvation is not the only thing I got. Do you mean there's better things than salvation? Uh-oh. Look what it says. He says, though we are speaking in this way, for God, ready, let's read it together, verse 10. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered, listen, and instilled ministering to the saints. So that means for the saints, for the people of God, especially those who are called to leadership, there really is no such things as days off. Woo, y'all quiet. No such thing. Now listen, when I say this, I'm not saying you can't take a vacation. That's not what I'm talking about. But somehow for the saints, that even if I'm chilling and I'm in... Australia, somebody may walk past me at the airport, and though I'm on vacation, something in me just begins to tap into the fact that this person needs some water, that though I'm off, I'm never really off. Are y'all here? Because if you can turn him off, I'm scared of you and for you. One thing I learned about God, he is a meddling something. He will meddle you in your sleep. He'll meddle you when you're awake. He will nag you when you're not thinking about it. You'll be driving your car and he'll meddle you. You'll be in Starbucks and he'll say really, really, really gently, pay for the coffee for the person behind you. Oh, see, some of y'all don't even know that's God's voice. You thought that was you. You ain't that good. You crazy. It's God's voice. God to tell you, pay for their groceries. Mm -mm, I just finally came up. Ooh, y'all ain't ready for this. You be at H-E-B and the Holy Ghost say, pay for their groceries. Mm -mm, I, just, I just got that bonus. That's for me. I'm going to GOAT today to buy me some shoes. I got a date with Amazon.com. Prime. That website you ladies be on, Shine or Shein or whatever that thing is called. <laughs> Got to get some of this clothes that tear easy. Make sure I buy me a 4X because you know over there in Asia, they are a little smaller. When it say all the way up to 7X, <laughs> go up there. I'm like, how do y'all wear these clothes? This ain't a large. This is a toddler large. <laughs> I 
All right. <laughs> All right. But look what it says. Verse 11. Read it. Let's read it together. Are y'all getting this today? All right. Verse 11 says, and we desire. Read it with me. And we desire that each, uh oh, that each one of you show the same diligence, I'll read it, as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. This is Hebrews 6 and 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Look at verse 12. Read it. Let's read it together. So that you will not be what? Okay. So we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. So as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, we serve every day with the hope about the future. And we remind ourselves of this so that we don't become sluggish. Can I be honest with you? I get tired too. He never promised me that I wouldn't get tired. But the end looks better than my momentary sluggish. That I think about all that I can do for him. Sometimes I got to take a few days to just breathe it out. But once I breathe it out, I'm ready to get right back into that thing. And even when I'm breathing it out, I'm really, I can't turn him off because he's still talking about more stuff for the future. He says, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Let's keep moving, all right? Let's look at Luke chapter 6 because y'all think this is the money scripture. I'm going to show you something totally different. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. I'm reading the New American Standard real quick, and then I want to go to the Message Bible. It says, give, and it will be given to you. Let's read it together. They will pour into your lap a good measure. Press down. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured. All right. When we get up and prophesy and preach, we say, give, and it should be given a good measure. Press down, shaking together, running over, that men shall give into your bosom. Say it. Right. So can I give you context? What if I told you that this scripture has nothing to do with money? Read your Bible. I'm not saying it doesn't work for money. But this is not the one that qualifies money. This one qualifies something different. Here, Jesus is really talking about how you treat other people. Let me help you. Message Bible, message 35. Start at verse 35, message Bible, please. Let's read this together. I tell you, love your enemies. See, if you're going to read the scripture, you got to have the context before. Love your enemies and help and give without expecting a return. Stop right there. Number one, he said, love your enemies. And then he says, give and don't expect a return. In context, he's not even talking about giving to people you like. He's talking about serving people you don't like. Y'all ain't ready for this gospel, right? Uh-huh. Here's the gospel. He says, you'll never, I promise, regret it. He says, live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives toward us, which means, oh, Lord, generously and graciously, even, y'all read this with me, when we're at our worst, our Father is kind. You be kind. <laughs> that real servanthood is when you don't even like the person you serve it. Oh, the church would rather pick on certain communities instead of, I wonder what would happen if we took the LGBTQIA, whatever you call it, and instead of boycotting some of the things they, listen, I ain't got to agree, but I wonder what would happen if we served a few families. I wonder what would happen Woo! if we gave water to those who are diametrically opposed to our belief system. Y'all ready for this gospel? 
I said, because we like to serve people that look like us, share our doctrine, share our belief systems, believe like we believe, that are charismatic and evangelical, and vote the way certain people want you to vote. But can you serve a prostitute who ain't got nothing to offer you? Can you give to a man who just got out of prison? Y'all quiet. Can you deal with somebody who smells like sin and looks like the worst? Or do you look at them with your religious eye and think to yourself, you Christian, how I cannot serve this? <laughs> do you sit up in the car and lock your door? That was already locked when you started the ignition and went into drive because you ended up at the stoplight and it was red and somebody had a cardboard sign that says they're giving away water for a dollar. Y'all quiet up in here? Oh, they're all fake. Where's that level of servant here? Because it's not just in church. That's why you can never turn this thing off. See, what would happen if we always saw others through the lens of how messed up we, watch this, presently are? Because Christians have a bad tendency of making everybody believe or leading them to believe that we are all okay. This is why you come week after week. You come to the well to be refreshed because you know you got some internal issues. And so does the one that's preaching to you. Even the shepherd had to drink the same water the sheep was drinking. All of us had to come to the same well. All right. Jesus keep going though. Verse 37. Can I keep going? They gave me six minutes, all right? Blame the Rebecca uh, and Miguel. Uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. Look at verse 37. Rebecca like, mm, would you come over here? She, she will serve you. <laughs> verse 37. Y'all don't know Rebecca. I already know. I picked her up in the Holy Ghost a long time ago. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, look at verse 37. Now, mind you, we talking about press down, shaking together, running on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He says, don't pick on people. Y'all, this is in the same context. It's not money. It's people. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Here's a promise. If you're critical of everybody else, Everybody else eventually will be critical of you. I'm too flawed to be critical. One preacher said, I'm too flawed to be fancy. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Oh, y'all won't want this gospel? Then he says, give away your life. You'll find life giving back, but not merely giving back. Giving back with the bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Hey, giving, not getting, is the way. Huh? Giving, not getting, is the way. Put some music to that. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. That was a whole bop. Y'all just missed it. But giving and not getting is the way. Somebody shout to me. Giving, giving. Not, getting not getting is the way. Y'all don't want to believe that. Say it again. Giving, giving. Not money, but yourself. You want to be great in the kingdom? Serve somebody else. You want to be great in the kingdom? Serve your local house. Y'all quiet, because some people want to be great and don't know how to submit to where God had planted them. I used to say, Lord, 
One day I want you to, uh, like, you know, because I, I grew up, I started preaching early, y'all. I was a kid preacher, I, you know, no mustache, nothing. Okay, I'm talking about fear and trembling every time I got to that microphone. Just like this, bro, just shooketh. <laughs> Oversized suits. <laughs> Jacket's way too big. I'm wearing a 40, 44 long, and I'm probably a 38 regular. Looking stupid. Just. And <laughs> I came up in the wide leg generation. Now, I'm, I'm younger than the brothers ran them. I'm much younger. I'm the baby. But they had the wide legs, you know, and they were, the wide leg pants was the joint with the, you know, with the alligator shoe, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so on TV, they were mimicking what they saw. Bishop Jakes would be out there with his, his stuff on. And, and, and my, one of my heroes, Clarence McClendon, and all these people preaching. And they just packing out conferences. And this is when the church era was just like, TBN was lit every night. Juanita Bynum sitting there with a Bible and rocking and praying for people. And she's supposed to be interviewing. And she ends up preaching from the seat. Y'all remember them? Eddie Long was, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. You would go home and you'd watch TBN all day long. You didn't have to change the channel for nothing. What news? Remember them days? This is all before a cool church. So I pray that prayer like, Lord, if you'd ever, Pastor Craig, make me, I want to preach on the stages like that. And it wasn't coming from a place of money because I didn't even know they got paid to do that. Ignorant. I just thought, you know, I would love to bless a lot of people. Man, Lord, please. I want to do a stadium one day. And he'd be like, yeah, you do? Like, mm-hmm, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Take these daggers here at this church. Lord, one day I want to do this and that. I want to do this and this. They started a rumor about you at church. No, I want to I do this and this and this and this. And I did something I wasn't supposed to do. And some of the saints found out. And, uh, and some of the, the, the mothers was praying about me at church. I even had family members jump in with the prayer. Oh, y'all, I don't care. I, re- I got delivered from all that. I don't, I don't care. And so, 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 you know, I made 20-year-old mistakes that a 20-year-old makes. And the Lord says, I said, Bishop, you got to sit me down because this and this and this. He said, man, please, your punishment is you're going to stay up. Y'all ain't ready for this. I got to, no, you're going to stay up and serve. Because I've never seen somebody so hard on themselves about their mistake. So your punishment is, am I going to let you hide? You're going to stay right there in front of the people and you're going to lead right through it. Y'all thought it was worship, but the tears was because I knew people were talking behind my back. Y'all quiet. And God said, you're going to serve even through your mistake. You're going to serve and you're going to hold on the whole time. And I got so busy serving them that I looked up one day and I was on a stage. And the room was packed out. And just so God knew it wasn't a flute, he did it again and again and again. It so happens so often now that it's just my normal situation. But if I didn't learn how to serve, that my way into whatever God's going to bring me into was not about business cards. I'll say, Doc, follow me on Instagram and I'll follow you back. It wasn't about IG. It wasn't about me paying you a crazy honorarium in hopes that you bring me to your church to do the same. It was about I'm going to serve whatever God has called me to serve. And I'm going to lead these kids into the future. Y'all quiet. And I'm going to treat this little small Bible study as if it's though it's a, the, the, the 10,000 people are in this room. You got to be committed to whatever God gives you to do. Are y'all here? You got to be committed to whatever, wherever God places you is where he wants you to serve until he releases you from that designation. Remember when our church started, I'm telling I would have did this a kid, y'all. When our church started, have a seat. I got one more scripture and I'm done. When our church started back in 2010, our first service, we had people there and they gave us some money. We was all excited. People was crying. We was excited. People joined. People like Stephanie Little. And, uh, you know, <laughs> she, had to- she had told me initially, Pastor Kim, 
The Lord didn't send me to your church. <laughs> and she was my friend. And I said, Ricky, I said to your wife, I said, so? I ain't asked you to come. Then I opened up the door to church. She was the first one down the aisle. <laughs> you know you called to this. <laughs> so I remember the whole service went by. We had no hiccups. People were there. God bless. We were excited. The presence of God showed up. I preached a little message. And uh, I was sitting in my mom's house afterwards with my best friend, Pastor YPJ. And Kenneth Lee, they came. That's how long Uncle Jay been here. So we're sitting in my mom's house talking. I went outside. There was a park across the street from my mom. I said, Lord, why'd you do this for me? And I said, man, all the years of serving in my former church, he said, no. I said, why'd you do this for me? He said, because you cleaned out toilets. <laughs> he said, remember when you was vacuuming and nobody told you to do it I said yeah he said I remember so if he rewarded me some 12 13 years 14 years after imagine what that man has the ability to remember he didn't reward me for preaching and being faithful to a to, to a youth ministry he rewarded me for cleaning toilets when you serve you got to know, God is taking note of all of this. And then one day I looked up and I saw myself and some of my spiritual sons willing to do whatever is necessary. And I said, whoa, I sold this. So now I sold now for other churches. I've been sowing the last 11 years for other cities. Are you here? How I gift myself to this is how I want to see it in the next situation. I'm not talking about leaving, y'all. I'm talking about we planting. I mean, just pull you. I can already feel you. Like, what? Well, he, this is the third time he didn't mention another city. What is this man talking about? I'm an apostle. I have to build. It's part of my oil. All right? I'll build it in position. Can I lead you to this last one? Philippians 2.13. I'm going to read it so you can play softly. I'm going to read it and I'm done. Philippians 2.13. Put that on the screen so they can see it. I'll read it to you, but I want you to see it. Verse 3. Start at verse 3. It says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than, our, than yourselves. So I'm to look at you and see you as more important than me. Are y'all hearing that? That's servanthood. You're more important than me and, and my, me, and all of me. I just can't take this right now. That's not how you view other people. You view them as more important than you. It's easy to serve when I look at this as you're important to God. Your purpose matters. I may not fully understand your character and the ways you move and all that kind of stuff, but you have a purpose because you're breathing. And it's important to me that I, whatever role I'm to play is to help you get to that place where you actually manifest what God has given you to manifest. Look at verse 4. Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Chris, get ready to close out even death on the cross for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow 
of those who are in heaven and under the heaven, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The point I want to get to is Christ emptied out himself. Christ, not Jesus. Christ is the anointing, the anointed one, and his anointing, the, the Christ, the Christos. Christ became flesh. He emptied out himself. He left uh, abundance, moved into poverty, which is flesh. And he did that to serve us. He, when he died, he served you. Are you here? He's still serving us at the right-hand side of God. How dare we not serve one another? You can't take your gifts and rob the people of God and think you're in the will of God. Some of you, we need, hey, we need somebody to work in the parking lot. You know how to, you just know how to direct and take direction. We shouldn't have to beg. Why are you robbing us of that gift? Some of you have administrative skills and you like, you know what, I can volunteer, you know, in a couple of hours or so at the day. Not wear my check. Where my check? You're a Christian. I led a youth group for nine years, no check. You know what my check is? I'm looking at my check. I sold in so I didn't have to sew it like this now. Are y'all here? There's certain doors that open when you serve the body of Christ. Yes, the body's frustrating. She's a mean woman. She's two-faced at times. She, she likes to swing. She's married to him, but she cheats on him all the time. You don't even have the capacity to love her the way he loves her. How many of you would be married to somebody who had, like, thousands of partners? Are y'all here? We're talking about the church, not the institution. You. How many times do you cheat on him for someone else? Y'all quiet up in here. Yes, you do. Yes, we do. How many times do we tell him, I'll never do this again and do it again? And he still keeps serving you. He still keeps serving you. He still stands at the right-hand side of his father interceding for you. So if he does that, what gives us the responsibility to think that we don't have to do the same? Even when we don't listen, even when I got to get my emotions under control. Servant is the way to the kingdom. You want promotion? Serve. You want to get to the future? Get low. You want God to bless you? Serve gift to other people. We got these babies on these cameras. I think to myself, while Jericho's serving here and others are around here, these kids, I'm saying to myself, man, they, they, are, they are seeding their own futures. Because at some point, she's going to go to college. And at some point, unless she's an all-A scholar, and even, if, even then, you still need money in college. But because she's serving, let me prophesy, she has the right to ask God for the future. Are y'all here? She's celebrating because I'm telling her the truth. And you still looking like Alice in Wonderland, the truth of the man. Don't you let the kids outserve you. Well, I'm so busy. I don't care how busy you are. We are never too busy to serve him. Well, my job is taking all this. I don't care how much time your job is taking. He's the one that gave you the job. You wouldn't have that funky job unless that man allowed you to, with the, the expertise in the open door to give it to you in the first place. How is it that anytime God blesses you outside of here, here has to suffer because of what you got outside of here? And I'm in the Bible. I got Bible. You have opinion, but I got Bible. Your opinion can't bless you. God is sick and tired of having to beg people 
to serve him not them we serve him by serving them switch the context it's about him and from that overflow of your servitude so we say hey once you're in tribes that's part of service you're serving somebody you don't know when you sit in a tribe somebody may have just lost a loved one and because of what you went through you can share with them you just serve somebody else Look at your neighbor and say, don't be stingy in this season. I'm not even talking about your money. I'm talking about you. He wants you. And I know this word was tight, but what about COVID? Do you tell your job what about COVID? Do you tell the movies what about COVID? COVID? Did you tell Papacitos about COVID? I bet you didn't tell that club what about COVID. How about the Essence Festival? You going to tell that? What about COVID? And if you go to another church, serve your church. And your pastor says, hey, I need somebody to come and do this. You should be the first one saying, Pastor, can I cut the grass? I notice that this grass is like 25 inches high. Let me get a few brothers. You don't got to be a part of a team to do that. Are y'all here? You see something on the ground, you don't walk past it. You pick it up. That matters. It matters that we serve. And not just the local church, but we serve the body. I don't want to go nowhere at 6 o'clock. But I'm a servant. My life is not my own. You think I love just flying off? Well, I do like flying. But you think I love just leaving my kids all the time, leaving my family? No. But there's a people waiting to hear what I got to say. Pastor Lisa's an educator. If you're an educator, wave your hand. Educators, wave your hand. Obey me. <laughs> if you're an educator, you're serving these kids, and you are probably underpaid. If you work with children at all, you're definitely underpaid. I don't care who you are. Principal and all, you're underpaid. You live with their parents and the staff. Let's be paying y'all at least $250,000 a year. Even though you get a check, you're still serving these kids' futures. I know our state government officials and all that have a certain way. So you're putting your life on the line as well. Servanthood. When you're on the job, serve. Don't just get the check. Go beyond the check. You see somebody who's sitting at their desk and they're quiet? Go and serve. Hey, can I talk to you about your story, your journey? What's going on? Hey, I noticed that you've been whatever be packing up your bags and leaving y'all quiet up in here four o'clock come first one running out is the believers I'm gonna say this I'm gonna shut up Pastor Craig and I used to work together many many moons ago and I remember I was on fire for Christ and we would literally sit up in the I thought about this in years. We would sit up in the car, we carpool, and we would pray in the parking lot, Lord, help us catch some fish today. And we would leave our car, go inside this telemarketing place, and we would preach the gospel to people when we wasn't taking calls. We would do lunch with people just to talk about Jesus. So many people got saved in this telemarketing company. Because Pastor Craig, myself, and a few others, were you part of that? A few others were working in that place. And we would, we would get back in our car to, to, to drive to our houses. And I remember we would, we would collect data. How many folk I saved today? Well, I led two today. I led so-and-so, so I got his name, his information. You were serving. Where is that body? You don't have to be an evangelist to serve. Where is that at? We complain about how bad the world is getting. But where are we serving? Where? It's grieves the Father. 
What are you doing? Are we just getting filled with the power of God and going home? Are we just coming in here and getting wrecked? Or does it mean something? People's lives are depending upon your sermon. Lift your hands. Let me pray for you. Pastor Chris, get ready. Father, I thank you for the level of servanthood that's about to come out of this word. And Father, though I've labored and taken my time with this, I pray that you honor, let nothing I said fall to the ground. Father, if we were offended in truth, we will adjust to the truth. Help us to be better servants of the kingdom of God. We talk about multiplication and revival, but Lord, we need a revival of service, a revival of servitude, not just a supernatural, but the Acts 2 church, where each man sold off his possessions to make sure his brother had. I pray for that type of revival of servitude in this house. And we serve not because we want to be seen of people. Mm -mm. We serve because without you, our lives would be terrible. We serve because we have access to you. We serve because we've been reconciled to the Father. And we give you praise. Repeat this after me. Father, I recommit myself to serving others in Jesus' name. Come on, shout that in Jesus' name. Say this with me. I got time for you. Woo! And I have time for your people. Ha! I have time for you. And I have time for your people in Jesus' name. Come on, if that word was for you, clap your hands all over the room. I love you all nations so much.